Hey, everybody. It's me, Robert Phoenix, and we are back for another edition of the Friday Farcast. And uh, today just seems like such an appropriate day on so many levels to have our, our guest, Lee Wells. And Lee, uh, this has all happened very quickly. Um, I was in touch with Janet Landers, who's going to join us a little bit later. And she told me about your efforts to help people in the panhandle who have been the victim of this just horrendous fire, which we're going to get into. And then I asked Janet last night as well, do you know somebody who could come on and talk about it? And she said, well, what about Lee? So we just really just cooked this up in less than 24 hours. And, you know, right. Providence and Grace operate this way. So I, and I'm a big fan of both. So welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. And um, let's find out a little more about you. Put your, your web page up, here. and we're gonna Absolutely. we're gonna share with people your bona fides. And, Absolutely. Uh, I'll just read your bio a little bit, and then we'll we'll get into more details. So uh, you go to LeeWellsOfficial.com, and you're gonna find out a lot more about Lee. And the link to the fundraiser is also there. So I'll just read through this. Lee Wells, author, speaker, coach, podcaster. Lee Wells has launched eight entrepreneurial initiatives initiatives in his life. Seven of those are small business companies. And one is the church he planted in 2011 and continues to pastor today. In the past, Lee built a construction company and lost it during the horrible economy following September 11, 2001. Shortly after that, he began a public speaking career that took him nationwide speaking an average of 48 weeks a year. That's a lot of moving around. Then he began his internet marketing company, which served clients all over North America with additional full-on service video production division added later in 2017. Lee formed Wells Cattle Company, which continues to provide ranch-raised beef in 2018. He started Wells Cattle Company Restaurant and Market, his ranch-to-table restaurant in Rockwall, Texas. Finally, as an addition to his ranching operation, he launched an all-natural liquid feed distributorship. That's, that's a lot of activity, Lee. <laughs> We're not finished. Keep reading. <laughs> oh, there's more. There's where more. is it? Where, well, where, where's the more? The more is what I'm doing now, uh, helping those in the panhandle. Right. And, uh, okay. So, we're, yeah. we're gonna get into that. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that's gonna be the that's gonna be the bulk of our our show today. Um, but tell us a little bit about yourself. Are you from the Rockwall area? Clearly, you're a Texan. Uh, yeah. Where, where, where did you grow up here, and what was your youth like? Yeah, I grew up in the Greenville area, uh, just just uh, east northeast of Dallas in Rockwall. And anytime growing up, I was we were going to go eat or do anything fun. It was always through Rockwall and into Dallas Mesquite. It was never out here. There wasn't anything to do out here in the country. Um, so I've grown up between the, where I'm at here in, in the Greenville area and the Rockwall area and graduated out here in the middle uh, from Caddo Mills High School. And then um, my father passed away. I've, I've, done, I've gone on and done other things, as you read. And uh, my father passed away in 17, 2017. And mom said, you got to do something with this ranch. I can't even mow the yard out here. It's just, you know, it's a lot. And so I began to take over the operation and change it out of my dad's name and debts and all that into mine. And it was shortly after that that we began providing beef. And then a year later started the restaurant. So um, I grew up on the ranch and grew up, uh, we had a dairy farm for a lot of years and that was no fun. That's I, I jokingly, but seriously say that's why I went and got a college degree is cause I was not going to be a dairy farmer, uh, married to twice a day, 365. And, um, but it was a great upbringing, uh, taught you how to work. It taught you to appreciate the animals, the land, the synergy that comes from that. Uh, production for others. Uh, there's a lot to learn being raised on a dairy farm that I wouldn't trade. Uh, it's just been, it's, it, I had the best upbringing. I had the best father, best mother. Mother's a, a 
a retired educator, English and Spanish teacher, and uh, just, you know, had a typical, I guess, kind of typical American upbringing and uh, just trying to live true to that as I progress through my life now, trying to give back to others and just be a, a decent person. Uh, we provide some of the best beef in, in the, in the world. And what we do, it's kind of different. We, um, we call it whole ground beef and we actually take the whole side of beef, grind it together, steaks, roast, brisket, everything comes together into our grind. And then we hand patty that, and make it into, uh, burgers. And so it's a ranch to table restaurant, scratch kitchen, uh, five sauces, from scratch every day, hand cut fries, mom and my aunt make all the desserts. So my daughter's starting to take over some of that. So it's just, it's just, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a great, it's a great experience to connect with the community. So that's what my day to day looks like. That's my normal life. And, uh, it's been a, it's been a great, it's been a great life, man. Lots of ups and downs. Uh, as you read in the bio, lost a company after nine 11, we thought we had skated by, for a year or so after the, the attacks and the economy crashed, and then it just caught up with everybody. There was no construction. There was no nothing being built. The, the nation at a standstill. And I think a lot of people lost out about that same time. And so we were definitely one of them and learned a whole lot, learned a whole lot about what not to do in a business. And since then now, um, I'm actually up to 10 companies uh, at this point. That, not that anyone's counting, but um, at the first of the year I launched Lee Wells Official, which is a, a speaking, coaching, uh, author. I have a book out. Uh, that effort. And um, and to get that book out, I had to create a, a publishing company. So that was easier than going through publishing companies. So right. uh, right. that's that's who I am. So you're a real hands-on guy. I mean, let's oh, just... Yeah. Yeah, if you if, if something's going to get done, you're you're going to do it, whether it's uh, milking a cow or starting a publishing company. Right. Um, and, and, and you know, this is the American way, right? This is what theoretically the American dream is about. If you uh, have a goal uh, and it's within reach, you you go after it, right? Yeah. You yeah. you make the effort, right? Um, and theoretically, it, it was open to everybody, and and I think to some extent still is. Sure. It's getting harder and harder as as we'll we'll, we'll dive in, in in a bit. So you're really living the American dream, and including the effort and the ups and downs, and the dedication and the discipline and the joy that comes from watching your efforts bear fruit and be able to pass it on to your children. So this is great, man. I mean, we're we're really glad to have you here because we don't have enough examples of people like you that are out there in the world showing other people that it can be done and not only can it be done in a lot of ways, it must be done. So, you know, kudos to you and your efforts. How, you. how is the podcasting side of it going? Are you getting a lot of traction with your message? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I think people that don't podcast don't understand how hard it is to get subscribers. It's, it's not like a like on Facebook or a thumbs up uh, on a YouTube video. Um, we really value, we really don't, we really value our subscribers. I mean, we, uh, we know what it takes to commit to, uh, that kind of commitment that, you know, is 30 minutes, an hour a week and wanting to be involved at that level. So, uh, it's hard to get, a, just some people make it look easy, but I think it's harder than it looks to get a solid following on any platform when we're podcasting. So it's a, it's a slower growth, uh, but it is a very, I'm in a steady growth system right now. It's of uh, a pretty good pickup every month. And so, uh, and I keep, I, I love doing it. I love podcasting. I love communicating with people, especially ones that will take the time to, to commit to you and listen to you. And, you know, it's just really special to, to be able to do that. So it's, I'm enjoying it. It's a lot of work. Yeah. But it's also it's also rewarding. To, I had a guy this weekend stop me and say, "Man, I've been listening to your podcast. I don't even know who he was. I'm I didn't, I've never seen him before." He said, "Thanks for doing that." He said, "I enjoy it every week. It comes out. I'm listening. That's yeah, pretty gratifying, you know, to, 
to have someone listen 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, whatever the podcast happens to be. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it is fun. And it's such an amazing tool that we have at our disposal. And, you know, I've been doing this now since, uh, since 2010. So I'm going on my 14th year of podcasting and streaming. And I'm always amazed at the impact that it has when we don't even realize, you know, that, that it's theoretically having like the, the guy who walked up to you and said, I really right. enjoyed listening to you. Right. And, you know, we, we tend to think that there's power in numbers, right? Oh, well, he's got 50,000 listeners or 50,000 followers or whatever. But if you have a smaller group of people who are dedicated and action oriented right. and are, are, are willing to uh, do some of the same things that you've done, which are take the initiative, help their fellow man and woman start businesses, right? That to me is more important. So it's really not about the quantity. It's about the quality of the people. Right. That you interact. I, I love, you know, yeah, I right. love the num. I love that first day and that first 24 hour, 48 hour number. Yeah. Because those are the folks that are with you subscribed. They're looking for Thursday in my, in my case, they're looking for Thursday morning. And they're they're there. I I love looking at that number. I mean, it's cool that it grows over time, and you and all your content continues to grow. But I love that first forty eight hours because I know those folks are they're with me and they're looking forward to it coming out. I just think that's a that's kind of a cool thing that I'm sure you understand as well is is a cool number to look at. Yeah. So I you know I'm kind of a beast at this. I you know I stream almost every day, mm. and most of my stuff is live. So, um, I, uh, yeah, my, the numbers for me are always, I don't know, they're always, it's always tertiary, right? My, I mean, and I've been going through this for a long time on, on YouTube where it feels like in many ways I'm shadow banned and people get unsubscribed for me and I, and that's, that's clearly on the record. So I've had to adjust my sales a little bit when it comes to the whole numbers thing. And it yeah. really just comes back to again, for me, quality versus quantity. Right. And, and if I can make that trade off, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do it all the time. Right. So let's, let's get into some of the, the gritty here. Um, we had, we had these fires in the panhandle. How long has it been now? Has it been about six and a half weeks? We're, we're, we're yeah. already on February 26 is when the fires began. Um, they they were running out there for for well, a certain number of, of fires continued on for uh, a couple of weeks. I mean, it was a hard hard set of fires to get out. The winds, the time of year, uh, they'd had a good a good fall and a lot of grass standing and a lot of fuel for the fire. So it was it was tough. It was a it was tough. Yeah, and estimated. 1.5 million acres is that right they're up to they're they're estimating up closer to two a little over two million when That's you crazy. In, when you include the edge of uh the western edge of oklahoma that got in there too yeah six counties in texas um some of them almost completely uh destroyed 90 95 percent of that heart of those counties are gone um thousands of miles of fence i i talked to a rancher the other day and he said he had 55 miles of fence and it's pretty much all burned up. One ranch has about 36 miles of fence. One has 40 miles of fence. It's, it's unbelievable. The numbers of acres and damages, the wellheads that are burned off the, uh, just the, the damage. I mean, yeah, that's a lot, that's, you know, those are things that people don't often think about, right? They just think scorched earth. Um, and then of course we get into the loss of, 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 uh, livestock and uh, 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 livestock life, but it's those other things like the wellheads and all the equipment that goes along with maintaining the land. Yeah. All which, of their, all of their grass is gone, but then all of their hay store is gone. Their barns are gone. Then they're uh, half their herd. Some, some of their entire herds gone. And I said this, one of my very first videos that I put out 
uh, about this back in March 1st area. Um, I said, you know, I had a, a loan I took out, bought some cows with some calves and grew them up, got them fat, took them to market. It was a small note. It was $85,000 note. Um, but here's the thing. I made a little money on that, but if a fire, a tornado, a flood, something would have taken those calves out, I would have still owed the money and had the bank known right then that they were gone, they would have called the note right then. And it's just an unforgiving world that agriculture lives in. I think it was Ronald Reagan that said, we are the only people who buy at retail and sell at wholesale. I think that sums up the, the disadvantage that we're in. Yeah. Right. It is. And, yeah. you know, and that's why a lot of farmers, um, perhaps not necessarily in the dairy world, but in the in the corn world, in the soy world, they get the government subsidies. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. It, and it, and it, and it you know, provides a, a bit of a hedge for their uh, for their crops. But at the same time, they're a proxy of the state because they're taking the government money. And, and, and I'll add. I'll add this, that a lot of your big beef producers, the big, big companies that your big box processing companies, I don't want to say their names, but uh, the big major companies are all subsidized as well. And then those of us who are on our own, our autonomous farmers, ranchers, we don't get any subsidies. So that's why sometimes you see our beef price is higher than what the store is. Well, that's subsidized uh, on the other end. We, We are not. So, right. yeah, it's not an equal playing field. It's at not. all. No, mm-hmm. no, we're uh, at a disadvantage. You mentioned the American dream and I will say there, the American dream is still possible, yeah. but it is getting harder and harder. Like you mentioned to achieve because I'm taxed at least five times on everything I make before anything gets to stay in my pocket. And wow. to say that we are American and America is small business first is a lie. It's just a fact. They are absolutely taking every dime they can from us. I'm not bitter. It's just true that I have to work three or four times as hard as I should have to being a producer in this country because of how hard they make it on us by taking every little bit. If you look back at COVID, look at who was left open and look who was forced to shut down. And you can see the priority of our American dream right there. Every mom and pop was shut down with the threat of prison and all of the big box stores were left open to, to continue taking all the business from everyone who could walk in. So, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's some, uh, there's some reality there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was, uh, clearly left open during COVID was, was liquor stores. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, you can go here, go on, go on over here and, and yeah. uh, give me, give yeah, me I, your business. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So why don't we do this? Why don't we play the trailer and uh, let people get a sense as to what you're working on with the film? And it's it's just about two minutes long, but it's really gripping. So let's, uh, let's bring it up here. The hey, wildfires. The stage, let me just rewind this a little bit. Let's give people the the full view. So uh, now the 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 name of the documentary is "We're Here Now." Is that right? We're here. We're here. We're mm-hmm. here. Okay. So keep that in mind as you you listen and watch, and you'll you'll understand why the the name is uh, uh, is essential to the trailer, and vice versa. Here we go. The wildfires burning out of control in the Texas panhandle. The wildfires took everything we had. I see the destruction and the devastation everywhere. Thousands of livestock have been lost and hundreds of homes and other structures decimated with well over a million acres turned to ash. Oh my gosh. Probably the meanest fire I've ever fought. Surrounded by flames, authorities tonight saying there are no exits out. We had no air support. I don't know where the air support was. We can't hold it. Get out of there. Let's pull out. We got too many spots. You were on your own. This was my living, and it's it's shattered. These are our friends and neighbors. Uh, if, if we don't help, who will? 
We got to stick together. This is what ranchers do. This is what farmers do. This is what Texas does. This fire has been one of the worst things that I've ever experienced in nature. And the kindness of people is some of the best I've ever seen in human kind. My neighbor came to me and said, I'm here to help you. And I said, get out of here. This fire's bad. He said, I got it. He crawled on the front of my truck. He said, you didn't leave me. I'm not leaving you. We're here. Wow, that is so gripping. Where, where are you in terms of the production schedule with the entire documentary? So we are currently filming. Uh, we have filmed uh, several days. Of course, you see there we've, we've filmed on site uh, for several days. We have done come back here and, and done some interviews here in this area for some that have helped create uh, the potential for aid. Uh, we've we've worked deals with feed mills at, to get it, feed at cost and various things that we've done and talked to them. Uh, we go back out. I fly out uh, Sunday and uh, Monday and Tuesday are film days out in the Panhandle. So we're currently gathering. Uh, we have several more filming days that we're going to to be having and and uh, for various reasons. But we're in the middle of just collecting all the data we can while it's fresh, while it's going on. And then we come back and start storyboarding and putting all of the uh, the raw data together. Because these interviews, I'm sitting behind the, the camera. I'm just, we're just having a conversation about what they've been through, what it was like seeing that fire come over the horizon. Uh, the one, the man in the cowboy had his name is Lee as well. And he said, uh, he said, you could feel the heat come over the horizon before you could see the flames. It was 50 to 70 mile an hour winds. Some of the information we have in this, uh, these are interviews that Tucker Carlson couldn't get. These are interviews that no news agency would ever be able to get. As a rancher, I was allowed into their homes. As a rancher, I was allowed to talk to them about our business and what we do and our, our heritage and and the in the role that we play in America, and they understand the purpose of this is to show that uh, ranchers work for other people. We do what we do to bless and to help and to provide. And there's a this is a shortened trailer. If you go and if anyone's interested, there's a, a full length six and a half minute trailer they could watch on YouTube or something. We might can put the link up later, but sure, we'll do or that. in your follow up uh, bio. But uh, in that he says. If I don't, if you so said we don't have cattle, if we can't feed our cattle, we can't feed the world. And that's what we do is we work to feed the world. We get up at daylight, we stay up way past dark to help other people have food on their plate. And it seems to me there's a war against that in our country. And we don't have the support from from our governmental agencies that we should. We don't have the help that should be there right now. And it does literally lay on the shoulders of neighbors to feed cattle. Our governor, I met him, I shook his hand, nice guy, talked to him about this, talked to several in his office, had several meetings with the with in Austin, uh, with Austin. And they said, you know, we can't feed cattle. We we can't, we can't fix fence. We there's things we just can't do or won't do. And I said, then it's on us. And so this documentary is going to bring to light uh, what these individual people, regular men and women, just like you and me, have gone through by themselves with the exception of neighbors stepping in and helping. And, of course, I'm just happy to be a neighbor. I may be a few hundred miles away from the panhandle out here in the Dallas area, but we've definitely become neighbors and right. we've met now. And so it's on our shoulders to make it happen. And, and it's on everyone's shoulders that becomes aware of this to some degree. Some of the best donations that I've received are four and $5 donations. Right. And they don't, it takes a lot of those. Okay. So I, I'm not saying give $4, but yeah. what I see when I see a $4 donation come in, it's like, man, that's what they had. And they shared what they had. They were right. they said, I don't have much, but I'm going to participate. I'm going to get involved. And that's pretty much what I did when I saw this is 
I didn't know what I could do, but I wanted to be involved. I wanted to step up and say, I'll, I'll help. I'll do everything I can do, whatever that is. And now if you look at the website, you can see that, you know, we're approaching, we're right at a quarter million dollars value added to the panhandle. And, and I had no idea we could do that when we started, but I think it starts with saying, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Right. Right. And I, and I, and I think it's really important to understand that we can have that kind of impact. And if you go back in time, that's really how it was before government metastasized yeah. and got involved with everything, right? right. You, you, had to, you had to work with people in your environment, right? Sure. You had to have each other's back. So this isn't anything really new. It's just a renewal of a contract that somehow got abrogated by the government along the way. <clears throat> I think the misnomer that we all have developed and I think government has tried, and I'm not anti-government. I, I, I think there's a place. Uh, I appreciate our military. I appreciate our law enforcement. I appreciate the structures in which we, I appreciate our roads, even though they get potholes. I appreciate our infrastructure. Uh, I'm not anti-government, but I do believe that the government has created a false narrative that they are more important than they are from Washington all the way down to county and city. I think that government has built themselves up as self-important to the place where we believe that. We believe that we have to have a certain guy in the White House. We have to have a certain guy in, in, in the Capitol. You know what? We don't. I haven't needed them. I ha and that's not being well, ugly. I just don't need you, apparently, because they haven't now he's not willing to extend any kind of surplus towards these people in the panhandle right i, I you know it does you know it doesn't surprise me that that would be his stance but did he give you any kind of rationale for that at all the only thing that i got back was the the reason that fema didn't show up the reason that red cross wasn't there the reason that they didn't deploy more services and helps is because it wasn't a large enough per capita humanitarian crisis it was a agricultural crisis and that was their distinction and that and that was their answer so i have to take that for what it is i don't know uh i believe my revelation in all of this is there are there are columns and spreadsheets that cannot cross the boundary of the column and so allocated money is voted on it's they have sessions on and there wasn't <laughs> there wasn't a column for this there's got to be an emergency fund somewhere right i mean yeah, i would on. think so yeah but they said they're in the government the governing of people not livestock even though you and i both know they are the same thing i i don't well, like, know I, I try not to get down on them yeah. Because that doesn't feed cattle, that doesn't rebuild fence, that doesn't help the ranchers in need. Right. But you and I can talk about it all day because we agree that they should be doing something. We and gotta I air it out just a little bit, right? We gotta air something. it out just a little bit. Anything I mean, they, can, they can move humans from the border around like cattle. Right. 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 But they, they can send some of them up to build fence. Yeah. Ironically. They, <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that, it, so we, we may get into some dark territory here, but one of the things that um, I've been following for quite a long time is this whole idea of disaster capitalism and what happened in the wake of uh, Hurricane Katrina, right, in New Orleans, and what happened with all of those. Uh, homes that were in the various wards that got flooded out. Those were legacy pieces of property that would be handed down from the grandmother to the mother to the grandkid, right? And those people were not going to abandon their homes unless something forced them to abandon their homes. And of course, Katrina comes and what do we see? We see this great diaspora coming out of New Orleans and people showing up in Houston and all over the place. And, oh, gee, we've got urban renewal happening in New Orleans. 
and we've seen other examples of this. You know, there are people in chat right now that are talking about Lahaina and what happened in Lahaina. And again, a very similar situation. You had legacy business owners that did not want to sell their businesses. They were fine. They were happy. You know, they were doing good business and they weren't going to leave unless something forced them to leave. And here we are in West Texas with legacy families, legacy farms, right? It's not like the Hill Country where your kids are going to sell your farmland for a winery, right? This is a whole different situation. And right. how are they going to get them to abandon their posts, right? How are they going to get them to abandon their property? Well, through a disaster. And again, this looks a lot like disaster capitalism. And I want to pick your brains a little bit about the conditions of the fire and um, why it started, how it started. Was it an unusual fire to the extent that in the video, your, 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 your uh, friend Lee talked about literally feeling the heat coming over the hill for miles away. Let's get into some of the details around the fire itself. What have you learned about it? Well, I'll start out by saying I'm not an expert. I'm not a firefighter. Uh, but Lee is uh, a certified uh, firefighter from West Texas a and M. I mean, most of these guys that have these ranches have fire trucks in their in their barn, and they're all part of the volunteer fire department. They, they all at least have skids that go in the back of their trucks or side-by-sides to get out and, and put fires out because wildfires are a normal part of their life. If, if you are familiar with these prairies, these, these plains, a lot of guys in the wintertime, when this starts getting dry and crispy, the, the ground does, um, they'll plant winter wheat around their house to be a fire guard. Um, because when it hits that green grass, it just is, it's as good as having a, a body of water there. And so you find that that is the way that, that a lot of them will fight the fire. And then there's the fact that they have fire trucks in their barn. So these are people who are well versed in this, this hazard. It's part of their life. They grew up fighting fires. Um, and what I've learned is there was a lot of discrepancies. There is, um, a lot of information. If someone really wants to dig into this topic, uh, there were a couple of weeks ago, Austin came out to the panhandle and they had, and they're, they're recorded they're They were televised hearings where they ask all these questions and they got heated. It was, it got ugly, ugly. There's stories of, of men, a man that was, had his own helicopter and they told him, get out of here. You can't, you can't dump water on this fire. I mean, I don't know why they would do that. He was so mad. He was ready to take it to the street. Um, you know, there were there were questionable things so like was this like happening during the fire or after the fire. During during the fire, while they were fighting, well, they're, the they're fire. having debates about how to deal with the fire while the fire is raging. No, they had the debates after. after they had the debates. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the after. fire was out. The fire yeah. has has been out, but they went back to revisit what happened. What happened okay. first, second, third. Who did what first, second, third? Uh, who helped and who didn't, and all that. So there was a lot of finger pointing. And one of the funny quotes was: uh, I was talking to a guy yesterday. And he said all these guys were getting up saying how they had done this and done that and done this. And somebody called him on it and said, "Did you really do any of that?" And they said, "Well, we sent emails to to get those things done." And they said, "Well, then you didn't do anything." And so it got pretty heated. It was. It's pretty good entertainment if you ever want to go back and, and uh, watch those. But there were questions about uh, why was the fire, why, why didn't we have air support? You know, Lee says in there, we looked up, there was no air support. We've always had air support and, and water coming in from the sky to help fight these fires. And to my understanding, it was six days in before they ever got any air support. Um, why? There's There's speculation i'm sure there's reasons uh, i've heard that fire season fire season contracts don't start till march 1st in texas and this was just happened to be february 26th is that coincidence is that a, a bad uh 
<laughs> happening that was accidental or on purpose. I don't know. Um, right. It is it is interesting facts. Uh, and the fact that they said it was too windy, and then you have other guys say, no, no, we've been in the wind in California, crosswinds of X miles an hour. I mean, you could dig into all of that. I don't know the answers. I do know that because of the amount of grass, dead grass, dormant grass on the ground, um, it was it, it was a, a tinderbox. And when those poles fell uh, with Excel Energy, um, and we know for a fact that those poles that were that fell had been inspected many times. The base of those poles were. Um, worn down by core samples. Um, there's signs on the pole, do not climb because it can't handle the weight of a human. Why anybody would leave a pole like that in 65, 70 mile an hour winds? I, I don't know. I don't understand that. Um, you know, there's things that are just, that are just mind boggling. I, I don't know. Um, it happened. It, it could have been a perfect storm. It could have been something more. One of the questions that was asked in that hearing was, uh, have all the fires that were started inspected? Now, I wasn't there. This is somewhat hearsay, but I'm hearing from people who were sitting there. So it's it's pretty clear that it's true uh, and verifiable if someone want to go back and watch. But they asked, what, have all the fires that started that day been been inspected by the fire marshals and they said, well, there were, I think it was 13 fires and only three were inspected. And they were asking questions like, why not? Why weren't the others inspected? And they said, well, you know, we've been busy, you know, it's a lot, a lot going on. And they're like, yeah. Um, how about do your job? One guy actually yeah. said, if you need a ride, if you need the gas money, I'll drive you out there so you can. I mean, it was a almost comical if it wasn't so sad. It was almost right. like a lot of things were going wrong all at once. And was that on purpose? I don't know. I wasn't there. I I do know. I see on the screen they do want us eating insects. They they do want us eating bugs. I mean, that's that's a fact. I mean, you look up. Uh, uh, cricket powder and you know and there's a scientific name for it that doesn't say you're eating crickets i don't remember what it is right now but yeah they they're already doing that they're putting cellulose in our food which is sawdust um i have a buddy of mine who is a missionary to his wife grew up in uh in the ukraine and so they're a missionary family back to the ukraine and she she came and visited our restaurant we were talking and uh, she said, growing up in the Ukraine, right on the edge of Russia, uh, we didn't have a lot of food, you know, communism, starving people. And they said, and this was crazy. This has been a few years ago. She said, we used to add paper to our gravy and uh, it would dissolve and it would give us some more uh, substance to be, feel full because we didn't have any meat and we didn't have any anything to get. We weren't full. So we would add cellulose basically to our food so we would feel full. And if you start looking at packaged food, you'll start seeing there's cricket protein, there's cellulose. And so these companies that are making these things, I'll just say it because it's true. If they could buy something that is grown in three months and bought on a commodities market like soybean, wouldn't it be a lot smarter business-wise than buying something that takes two to three years to produce like a cow and they still get the same nutrition facts at the end of the day and they don't care what they're feeding us anyway. I mean, that's kind of business savvy if if you didn't care what people were eating. So I don't know about all of this uh, as far as facts go, but when we observe the evidences, it sure looks like there's a war against autonomous farmers in America. And I, and I, and as one, I, I know the difficulties that we face cattle are higher than I've ever seen them in my life. It's right. astronomical what it costs to have a cow right now, have, have cattle, have a herd. And at the same time, these guys have lost half their herds. They've lost upwards of, of 15 to 20,000 head. And 
you probably don't know that if you watch the news because no one said that. Right. So that was another question I was going to ask you was the amount of livestock that was lost. So you estimate 15 to 20,000 or more than that. It's at least that. Um, it depends on who you talk to. And I've asked the questions. Um, there's not been a comprehensive number. For some reason, there's not been a comprehensive number provided for all the counties. Um, but just talking to the different leaders in the different counties, I'm in, in contact every day with some group of people every day with the panhandle. So uh, I've estimated across those counties that with just the reports of different guys telling me different numbers, some have lost 450 head. Some have lost, you know, 700 head. Another guy said he lost 700 head. I, I'm not verifying these numbers myself, but the estimates up front were somewhere between 75 and, and 10, uh, and a thousand, uh, 10,000, 7,500 and 10,000. Well, if you go back and add on the others that we're talking about, it can get there real quick. Um, there's three waves of death. If I, if, if you want me to go into it real quick, there's yeah, three yeah. waves of death that happen in a fire. Uh, first, the smoke inhalation in the fire itself will trap them against the fence or they will run until they can't and the smoke will overtake them and they're out of breath and it won't take long for smoke inhalation to pull the oxygen out of their body and, and they'll die. That happens as the fire's moving through the country. But what people don't realize if you're not in this business and if you've not been following along is the next day or two or three or four, you're having to put down cattle. You're having to shoot them because their injuries they sustained are too harsh for them to overcome. If their hooves are burned, they'll lay down. They don't want to stand on their hooves. They'll, they'll just, they'll just stay there and, 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 and die. Um, you can't let an animal suffer like that. No. Um, calves that have their hooves burned off their ears burned off their 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 lips are burned off you can't let an animal suffer um right. the and the hardest thing a rancher will ever do is put down one of his own cows because we're raised to take care of them we're raised to see disease we're raised to see sickness we're raised to see nutritional um the the uh things that 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 they're deprived of we we're raised to see that we're not raised to kill them, to shoot them, to waste them. I mean, that's right. not what we do. Yeah. Uh, so then the, the third wave is about two weeks after that you pull up and you listen to their lungs. And if their lungs are rattling, they're going to develop pneumonia. They won't overcome. And so that's kind of the third wave. And I think when the estimates of numbers came in, they were only talking about those immediately killed by the fire and smoke. And so I have added to that. I know some guys that have put down as many as has lost in the fire. Um, and then you don't even consider in those numbers, the number of calves that are going to be lost because they have lost their calves to stillborn stillbirth because of the lack of oxygen. It's, it's a multiplicity of, of problems that just keep multiplying. It's, it's not a, it's not a good picture. And it should be given more attention than it has been. I, I just, I've been appalled at the lack of discussion. And uh, if you look at my webpage, I've got every article that I've been in and every newscast that I've been on. And I've been trying to tell folks about this and, and educate America as best I can. But I'm just one voice. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today and to meet you and to talk about this. Because this is going to affect every person across our nation. Yep. Uh, Texas has by far the most number of cattle in America. Yep. And the panhandle has 80 to 85% of all of Texas's cattle. Staggering. And this should be a major ongoing investigation, news story, and it won't be. Right, right. The other thing, and, and, and I'm sure you factored this in, but the other thing, isn't just the loss of the immediate life, but the the procreative and regenerative life that would happen as a result of a healthy herd. Right. 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 That's not so going to happen. You lose your calves up front. So yeah. that's so in, in 12 to 24 months, you don't have a calf crop to either replace older cattle or, or send to the 
send to the processor to be beef on our tables. And so you've lost almost a whole herd right there that we're not totally counting. Right. Then you also lose, even though these cows may look healthy and they may not develop pneumonia does not mean that they can still have calves and they can still, still get bred and still right. move forward as a right. productive a part of the herd. You don't know that until it's going to be a year and a half before you know that it'll, it'll, it'll be a while before you figure out that this cow's not going to have a calf and then you have to replace it. And then you have to rebreed. see, it's a, it's a longer term process than just figuring it out. You have to then replace it. And so that's why I say a year and a half to get back to square one. And I want to address another thing that people talk about. Sometimes they say, well, why wouldn't they have insurance? Especially if they've had fires before, why wouldn't they have insurance? There's no such thing as a viable livestock insurance. Now, do they offer it? Absolutely. Do they offer insurance for Lamborghinis and Ferraris? Absolutely. Most people can't afford the insurance on a Lamborghini. Therefore, it doesn't matter because they can't afford the Lamborghini. Right. There is insurance available for cattle. But if you, if you analyze the numbers, with what you're paying in premium, you can almost replace that herd every 10 to 12 years. Mm -hmm. That's not possible. That's not in the, in the slim margins that we work in, in agriculture as it is, there's not enough surplus to be able to have that kind of insurance. So you, you just say, I'll, I'll risk it because I don't have the, the premiums to be able to, to insure against it. And then so people have insurance on their vehicles and their homes. I mean, people have insurance on those things, but you can't insure fence. You right. can't insure grass. Not, not really. I mean, you can have some drought assistance and programs like that, but they're kind of a joke too. If you want to be honest, um, I've insured my grass for, I run almost a thousand acres and uh, I've insured my grass for a few years. I quit doing it because one of the biggest droughts in our recent history was a couple of years ago. And they sent me a, it was an $1,800 check. I was, I, I, I told them, I, I just want to send this back to you because that's what a, two loads of hay, a load of hay. I mean, you're right. not helping me. Right. So I canceled all that because I'm paying. I mean, once your premiums are paid and you end up with 1500 bucks, that's a joke. So people outside of agriculture will say things that they don't understand. And they'll be hurtful with their comments because of their ignorance. And so don't tell a rancher you should have had insurance. Or you might get you might get a, a, a rude awakening. <laughs> you might get throat punched because it's not a it's not a thing like vehicular insurance or um it's almost like health insurance is getting. Yeah. You know, you, you got you get sick. Well, you should have had insurance. Well, you know, you know how much you have to spend a month to have insurance on a family? It's it's cost prohibitive for most people. Yeah. So it's yeah. I just want to address that because there's a lot of listeners that perhaps won't understand uh that those aren't really options in real life. Yeah. You know, recently I it, it's I just did a lot. Kind of a bit of a shallow dive on uh the IRS uh tax liens, uh possession of property, things like that. And the, there are only two things that the IRS is not allowed to take from a person. One are tools, because that would keep the person from uh, being able to repay the debt, right? Right. The, tools are the other was cattle. Like the IRS cannot repossess cattle because it's connected and related to the livelihood of that person. Right. And I thought yeah. that that was a really interesting little like notch that they had put in there. Uh, and it shows how important cattle is. Right. Like on a mundane level, it's like, well, we can't take that because you need that to pay us back. That's I think that was interesting. But on it the is. other hand, it's like, well. Nature theory. Right. right? Like that's that's the other side of the up oh, glitched out a little bit there. Um 
were the winds during that time normal, right? Do they have 80 to 90 per hour, mile per hour winds at that time of year in Panhandle? They they have high winds out there, yes. Uh, two weekends ago, it was at 65 miles an hour uh, on for uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I think it was. And I, I got a lot of pictures, video back of dust storms. That That is normal. Uh, I tell you the abnormal parts to me are why a pole was left or a series of poles were left in that condition to fall. And they're yeah. investigating that. They have attorneys looking at that. Um, there's interesting things that, that come into play as to why fires weren't investigated. They said on the three that they did investigate, they didn't see any, any uh, evidence of arson, so they just moved on. I guess they're just arson investigators and that's it. Uh, how about, how about expand your reach a little and tell us what you can really tell us, but they, they wouldn't. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting is they had more grass standing than, than most years. And a lot of those pastures were, um, they were paid to stay off of them. And so there was uh, a lot of fuel load out there with, with pastures that were intentionally not grazed down um, and paid to stay in furlough. So they, you know, is that interesting? I don't know. Uh, but it contributed to the mass of fire, heat, energy that was, and of course, under those winds, what was produced. And it just rolled that country over. I mean, it just, it just destroyed it. It looks it literally looked like an apocalypse. I mean, it looked like a what we would think of a, a nuclear attack would look like. I mean, just scorched earth is what it right. what it was. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The whole thing feels rather demonic to me, to be honest with you. Yeah. Right. And, and I don't think I'm overreaching in hyperbole. It just feels demonic from top to bottom, from the intensity of the heat. The amount of damage, the the carnage to people's lives and livelihood, almost the sacrificial loss of the cattle, the lack of response, the lack of coverage. I mean, it from the top down, it just it just it's, feels utterly demonic. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of emotions that come into this, uh, especially working as closely as I have. This is one of the hardest things I've ever done, and I've done a lot of things. I've I've done some things. We talked about at the top of the show. This is the hardest thing I've ever done. You would think you would think some other things might be harder, like running a restaurant or running a ranch. But this has been tough because you have questions that you can't get answers to. And I just have to keep coming back to the fact that I'm here to help ranchers. I'm here to help them through this. Right. Another interesting, I made a post this weekend, this past weekend. And I don't know if your listeners are going to know this, and I don't know if they're going to be ready for me to say this, but the most dangerous occupation in America when it comes to suicide is agriculture. Yeah. There is twice as many agriculture rancher farmer deaths twice as many a year than veterans. Um, if you're in agriculture, you are 3.5 times more likely to take your own life than an average American in this country. The reason for that is how unforgiving disasters are. They are unforgiving. Banks are unforgiving. The IRS is unforgiving. Speaking of the IRS, all of these guys that are going to have to sell their herds off and cattle prices are high. They're going to make money this year because they don't have fences or they, they don't have feed or they don't have a place to, to shuttle them off to uh, on a lease with some grass at a, at a, at a daily rate. Uh, they don't have the ability to do that, or they don't have the location to send them to with grass. So they're going to sell them. Right. And if you sell a thousand head and they're bringing to $2,500 a piece, can you imagine the IRS implications on taxing that? Because that's gains, that's yeah. income. Yeah. And you don't have the offset in losses on your balance sheet to handle that. And so they're going to be merciless on these men and women when they show that in their taxes in 2025. 
There's no hope. There's no, there's no handout. It's not easy. And it takes lives of good men and women way too often. Yeah. And so that's one of the realities that I am fighting. I'm trying, I call back to these guys that I've met uh, almost weekly and talk to them. What are you doing, man? How are you doing? Just, I'm here. If you need anything, I don't know if it means anything or not, but it's what I can do. Um, we were going to be at a concert with, um, on, on Sunday evening with, Michael Martin Murphy and Lyle Lovett and Amarillo. And I've extended, I've, I've got them to give me tickets. And I invited all these ranchers that I've met out there and say, Hey, come take a night off, have a steak dinner and, and, and listen to some good music. Come, you know, we're going to show the trailer there. They're being very kind to us, but come take a night off and just enjoy some time with your family. And, you know, if I can do anything for someone that could help their ranch, but really ultimately save their life. I think that's really what it comes down to for me is if I can do something for someone, that's what we all should be looking to do. And, and that, that extends to everyone that hears this today. You don't know what your neighbor's going through. You don't know how closely they may be to giving up on everything. Uh, there was a, there was a, a very famous Christian singer this, this today that came out, um, uh, passing away. And she had been on American Idol. And the comment that stuck out to me was she had struggled with her mental health for years. And to me, that's a, sig that's a signal as to how she passed at the exact same age I am, 47, 48 years old. When you struggle, that's the symbol that someone could put into a obituary-like post. Right. Yeah. Well, you never know. You never know what someone's oh, yeah. going through. So I believe that's the that's the motivations. Um, when it all comes down to it, that's part of the motivation of what we're doing. What kind of response is the crowd going to have when Michael Martin Murphy sings Wildfire? I know. I don't know how that's going to go. That is. I, that's his top be, I'd song. I'd be here for that, actually. <laughs> They're going to be expecting it. I mean, yeah. they're going to be expecting it. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's start to make a bit of a pivot here. Sure. And let's talk about what you're doing and the solution. And uh, I think Janet is listening. So, Janet, uh, you have the link. Uh, why don't you jump on in and um, talk about what you're doing? And let me go to the uh, website here so people can uh, can see the uh, – the fundraising effort that's going on. And uh, we put a link both in the show notes and also in the uh, chat that uh, where people can go and, and uh, chip in if they want to. So this is the uh, relief page right here. So far, it looks like you've got $130,422, which I love how you've done this here. You, you've, um, you you basically have done the figures. So I guess we're at 205 uh, tons of grain, 100, uh, 1,075 bales of hay, 26,400 feet of fence, total donation value, so 249. So this is, this is what this adds up to. Is that correct? So, yes, when you take, when you take all the value that we've sent out there in the hard dollar donation, category we're at a quarter million dollars and in this 130 i've got a i still have i haven't used all of that so once we get up into that full donation value it's going to be it, it'll at least be a half a million that we've handled uh getting out there within donations of of grain hay um feed a fence all of that so we've still got i still have some money in there to utilize what we have done is we have we have overloaded their uh, their systems with feed, being able to give that much to them, and so we've got everybody kind of in a holding pattern, and so I've held some money there for just a couple of weeks. We're right. going to start shipping some more feed once they have some more bin space and storage. Right. Yeah. Um, it's going to. Let me just say this. How, this is this is going to be a. 
a, a six month recovery just on trying to keep their cattle fed. And it's not just because the fires are out doesn't mean the work is over. It actually means the work begins. And so we have been through maybe like a phase one of helping them keep their cattle alive, but we're coming up on a hot summer. Um, their grass, they have had one, they've had one rain since the fire. One. Some places have had just a half inch of rain is all they've had since the fire. And so the grass is growing very slowly. And so we have to keep hay moving out there. There's one ranch that I know of uses 30 bales, 30 round bales a day is how much they're feeding because of the number of cattle that they have. Wow. What's your goal here? We, I mean, obviously, sky's the limit, but what would you theoretically be happy with? As far as money raised? Yeah. Or, yeah. Well, that's two parts. One part is we have to keep sending, uh, maneuvering and delivering hay from Northeast Texas out to the panhandle. So we pay fuel on some of those trips and help those donated drivers make that possible. A lot of them are younger guys, ranch guys, uh, helpers that don't make a lot of money. And, and each trip's going to be about a $500 trip out and back on fuel. Um, we've got a deal work for $325. We can send a ton of feed out there uh, at cost. So we're going to continue doing that. We're now building fence with Reach Out Worldwide this next week. We have five miles of fence going in. Um, so we're we're doing things with other organizations. We're teaming up with them to bring volunteers in. Uh, we're working with other donations and other organizations to say, hey, help us help us buy materials to be able to give fence to people. Just to give you an idea, fence is costing between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars a mile to tear out and put in, depending on terrain. So it's about a seventeen thousand dollar average per mile. And remember, some of these ranches have, you know, fifty miles of fence. Um, some of these places, the smallest ranch that I know of that I've actually talked to, he said I have eight miles of perimeter fence to replace. Eight miles. And it's 15,000 at the very lowest end, the easiest kind of fence up to 20. If it's in a cap rocks or it's got some rocky terrain, um, that's an impossible number for a guy like me, you, them, they, they don't just cause they have that kind of acreage that they're their fifth generation doesn't mean they have the liquid capital to go out and spend a million quarter million, half a million dollars in fencing right now. So right. it's a beautiful right. thing to be able to give somebody something like that on those, on this five miles that we're doing now, it's actually going to take care of three different landowners front end fencing along a highway. Very important to do, but they don't have any help there because there's no neighbor to help 50 50. There's no program to help them get that replaced. And so we're trying to find the most helpful places. There's a, Another opportunity for another five miles, 4.8 miles of fence we could build out there for a widow woman who ranches all by herself. She's in her 70s, and she's got a 9,000-acre pasture that needs a cross fence because all of them are burned out. And she's got neighbors helping on the sides, but she doesn't have any way to divide that 9,000-acre pasture. And that one fence across that one pasture is almost five miles long. Wow. And you do the math on that, that's 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 upwards of you know eighty thousand dollars or something. Right. Who, who has there's, that? There's, 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 you're right. There, the, the amount of liquidity these people at their disposal is highly limited, I'm sure. Right. So they're, it's not just like cash on hand. They're just gonna there's no way. Know. There's no yeah. way these we'll ranchers take that kind of money. No grand, eighty grand, and you know, we'll take care of this. Um, they, they don't have it. And so there's organizations, there's people that are out there that are saying, we have money. We just don't know the right place to put it. Or we don't right. trust big organizations like X, Y, and Z um, because they have such big overheads and such administrative costs. Maybe 40 cents on a dollar goes to the, to the, the, the place that 
you know, you're actually giving to, right? We, I don't make anything on this. I'm blessed. I have, I have multiple companies operating. I've got great teams of people that have allowed me to step away from the day to day to handle this. And I do it for free. I've not, I wouldn't take a cent. I've, I'm paying my own way to Amarillo this week to shoot more video. I'm paying for the, so far I've paid for all of the video that's been shot and all the editing that's happened out of my pocket because I want this donated money for feed to go to feed. That's just my, that's my heart. And I want it to go to these ranchers. Now that's part one was the feed, the fence and all that. Part two is I will need some help to get the documentary finished. It's going to be about a hundred thousand dollars to do that. Uh, I don't have that uh, liquid cash to just right. go drop a check and make that happen. Um, I'll be at about 15,000 my out of my pocket, my credit cards to get to this point. And I don't mind telling you that I haven't taken a dime off of that ticker right there for the documentary um, because I really want that to go help, help these, these people. And I feel like that's where it was given. And right. so that's what I have to do. We're 501 C three. What comes in earmarked for a purpose has to go out for that purpose. And so my ethics say that's exactly what we're going to do, even if I have to pay for other things by myself. But I would love some someone, if you asked me for the for the world, right? You just said the sky's yeah, the limit, what do you want? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you. I would love someone to say, here's here's fifty thousand, here's ten thousand, here's a thousand five, whatever. Here's a here's a whole hundred thousand and earmark that for for the documentary. That that would free me up to be able to spend that on the documentary, pay myself, my pay my credit cards, uh, and and be able to to get squared up with that and then not be slowed down because we have to capture this now. We have to get these stories now. We can't wait a year and then come back to this. It's not going to work right. We got to have the emotion of now. That's right. Yeah. And it has to happen now. So that's why I've set everything aside to do these things and take this time to do it while we can get it done right. And we can get the genuine emotion, manufactured emotion. I, I'm not interested in that. Um, I, I see the screen that says Matthew McConaughey. I, I've you, you praying people pray with me. Um, I have a contact in, in, uh, in Hollywood and he has become a friend. He's a producer of a, of a big, big name, um, uh, show. And he had lunch yesterday with a producer who is best friends with McConaughey's wife. And they are showing them somehow they're thinking about how to show her this trailer and ask Matthew McConaughey, if he would be the voice of this documentary. Now, the chances of that, I don't know what they are. I just know that you don't have it because you don't ask for it. And so we're going after it. We're asking for it. And I would love to work with a guy like that. It would add credibility to the project, but it would also give a genuine Texas relatable sound and feel. I think it would be a beautiful match. I would say so oh, it's, like it's a perfect fit. I think so. It's funny that someone said that because that's a that's exactly what direction we're going. I would love, I would love nothing more than the opportunity to speak with him about that. So um, I don't know how all this works. I've never created a film or a documentary before. Um, I've done a lot of other things, so I feel like I can do this. Uh, the trailer, I think, shows that we can do something. The trailer um, looks good. I mean, you know, there's some chops in the trailer. It conveys emotion. Uh, yeah. It tells a bit of a story. It's got a story arc. I think you did a great job there. Yeah. And there's two or three other places we want to go with that. One of them is the asset that wildlife plays in the ranching uh, world in the, in the, in the ecosystem. People do not understand. They, they think, especially where you're at, they think that wildlife's a nuisance um, in the hill country. The wildlife's a nuisance. Everyone wants to shoot the deer because they eat their plants and their flowers. Right. Um, but uh, people don't realize that these big ranches uh, 20 to 60 percent, depending on who you talk to, of their income comes from the wildlife side hunts, uh, which help to thin the population, which keep it healthy. Uh, and then they eat what the 
what the cows won't eat. And so the synergies of what they do for the, for the land is amazing. So we're going to talk about that, how ranchers and wildlife get along, how cows and wildlife work together to make the best ecosystem. And I'll say this, a lot of, a lot of the documentaries that are out villainize cattle, the green initiatives villainize cattle. And, yeah. and they, they think that we don't take care of environments. I, I want to submit to anybody, and I will challenge anybody on this topic, uh, the most the most eco-friendly people in the world are ranchers. I care more about my grass and my soil and the things that are going on right now on my property. I am more concerned with that than anything. And the most activated activists, green, whatever, you don't hold a candle to how much I care about my grass yeah. and about my, my animals and about yeah. the, the future of this ground producing well, the fertilizers that I use are all natural. You know, you're not going to, you're not going to catch me using Roundup. I care more about this, this world and that I live in than anybody. So we're not villains. We're not, we're not the enemy. We are working to preserve this, this country and working to preserve our land and, and the ecosystems, the fish, the, the, the birds, the, and it all plays in together with the wildlife and the animals. They all live in concert. And I think that's just a point that I'd like to make to those who may not be aware of uh, just how passionate we are about our earth. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of these people that are, you know, ecologically, uh, you know, you know, oriented or ecologically uh, ideologues, they're they're policy wonks. They're academics. They don't live on or near the land. They don't understand the ecosystems. Right. right? <laughs> they don't, they only understand uh, theory and policy. So, you know, you get your feet dirty and get on the ground and yeah. see really what's happening here. Yeah. Um, analyze, the, analyze some microbe counts in some soil and watch it build that, that, uh, that natural loam and build up those things that, that produce organic matter over years. And, and I don't want it to blow away and I don't want it to wash away. And I want it to produce as, as good as it can for not only my cattle, but for the birds, the rabbits, the, the deer, everything to work the way that this has done it for years. The, the Indians knew it. Uh, our ancestors knew it. They knew exactly how to keep all of that healthy. And I think that we should, we should get the credit for, for the work that we put in on that instead of being I, 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 totally, I totally agree. Um, I got to, I got to do a little uh, SOS to Janet. Janet, I see you in the studio. And I can't bring you in because you have to activate your camera and your mic. So there is a little prompt for you to activate your camera and your mic. And once you do that, I can bring you into the studio. But unless you do that, I can't do anything. So give it another shot, Janet, and uh, see if you can uh, just click on add mic, add camera. Okay. All right. I see that you get that out of the way. There was a comment on uh, that I put up on the screen which was uh, Contact Rome Ranch. Are you familiar with them here in the Hill Country? I'm not, but I, I made a note. I made a note about it. They're, they're exactly what you're talking about. They, uh, they're all about the preservation of the prairie and the grasslands, and they raise bison. And, and uh, uh, so they've got, they're, 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 they're kind of in, you know, they're not exactly in your business, but they're related to your business. Well, we have the same we have the same goals in mind for exactly. the land. I yeah. was up in Oklahoma. My father was a was a um, before my time. He was a foreman on the largest ranch in Oklahoma, the Chapman Barnard Ranch, which is next door. And the Drummonds now have bought some of that land. Reed Drummond, the Pioneer Woman, those guys up there, uh, they have the largest ranch now. But they bought out some of this back in the '60s early seventies, my father was on that, on that ranch. Um, and they, they turned it into a preserve when they shut that ranch down. And I was out there visiting last, uh, last fall and they were open and they talked about conservation. And they said that when, 
when land is laid fallow and there's no animals, there's no uh, hooved animals on it, like like your bison or your cattle or whatever, there is a degradation that begins to happen and it the plant life begins to wane and the number of species begin to diminish. And they began to do this study, and they, they, of course, all the universities are connected out there. O, 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 U, OSU, all of them are. They've got connections out there on that on that preserve, and they have watched just in a few years the species. I think it was doubled or tripled the number of native species coming back once they release wildlife, once they release the the bison back out on there. And so people say cattle destroy, and uh, not at all. Not at they all. They actually. They rejuvenate. There's places their hooves are built to 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 do, be many cultivators and leave divots for seeds to sit and be covered. And it's a it's an amazing thing that that is created whenever the synergies are realized. And so it's it's a conversation we could have for two or three more hours, but we don't have time for. But uh, but we're not the enemy, is what I'm saying. We are we are very concerned with our our earth. We're concerned with the atmosphere. We're concerned with all the things that everyone else is, but, but we, we feel like we have solutions that uh, policy won't necessarily fix. Right. I mean, you guys are involved in the circle of life. I mean, mm-hmm. this is really what it's all about. And again, when you isolate uh, certain elements out and use those isolated elements for particular research or re- research projects, you're, you're eliminating all the other things that go along with the entire process, which right. is generally what happens with, with modern science. Uh, we're going to bring Janet there's... on by phone because she's having sure. a difficult time getting into the uh, the studio here. Listen to her on and she can talk. You know, I've got a cool picture of her mother that we can put up here and talk about the, the fundraiser she's doing. So let's do that. Glad to have her on. Hey, Janet, how are you? Well, it's well, it's okay. So there, there's always an audible, right? We can always pull an audible. So I'm going to put up a, a a nice picture here of your mother. And it's her it's her 99th birthday. There she is. There, there's uh there's there's Grand Liddy Lou right there looking very Texan in all her Texan finery. So talk so so talk a little bit about the fundraiser because you were the person who was the connecting link between myself and Lee today. And and uh, let's talk about the fundraiser a little bit and how people um through your end can also help out. We can't. We can't hear her. You can't hear. No. Oh, put her. Maybe put speak. on speaker and put your bite base of your phone to your mic. Yeah, it's right there on speaker. Um, go ahead, Janet. Try again. I'm gonna turn the mic up all the way. All right, go ahead. Robert, we can't hear. Oh, uh, Janet, this is not Janet. This is not working for whatever reason. All right. So, so why translate. don't you tell, why don't, yeah, why don't you just tell me? Her. Yeah, why don't you just tell me what the details are? And then I can then I can share them with everybody else. Okay. Okay, so let me break this down. So basically what Janet is saying is that at 99, her mother does not need any more birthday presents. And so when she heard about the fires in Amarillo, it really impacted her. And even at 99, she wanted to know what she could do and how she could get involved. So where does it go from there, Janet? Really, really set off 
Okay. Uh, even at 99, there's not a lot she can actually do, but I can do it for her. Right. So what Janet is basically saying is that she's reaching out to as many people as possible, uh, i.e. myself and others. And it's on um, behalf of her mother the, that she's, you know, using her and her birthday and her roots as a Texan as kind of a calling card. And, and again, this whole idea of, celebration and gifts and reciprocity are being transferred into your fund to help the people in the panhandle. So that's really what we're talking about here. So are you going to have a birthday party at all or anything, Janet? Her birthday is always on the 18th. Okay. Well, good. Well, we'll look forward to some pictures. And uh, so uh, yeah, if you are in, interested in uh, donating to Lee's fund, and if you are so moved to uh, spread the word like Janet has through her mother and using her mother as a way to bring awareness and her her birthday to bring awareness to um, this event and the ability to help our friends and neighbors, go go for it. Make it happen, right? You know, many hands makes light work. Right, Janet? Well, thank you for kind of being on. Um, that's okay. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye-bye. So that's really the, the gist of this, is that her mother wanted to participate somehow. Her mother felt terrible about what has happened. So Janet is using this period for the uh, the ramp up of her mother's 99th birthday to essentially said, hey, don't give a gift to my mother, even though you probably wouldn't anyway, but use this opportunity to gift the people in the panhandle so that they can continue with their livelihoods. And then perhaps someday they can have a 99th birthday celebration and do it in a way that is connected to their life and livelihood and their lifestyle. So that's, and, and it's, and Janet really was the connecting link between me and you today, Lee. Right. And, and it really wouldn't have happened, I guess, if it wasn't for her mother. So there's something to be said for all of this. Love it. I love that picture too. Great picture, right? Great picture. All right. Do you have any other details that you want to share with folks before we sign off today? You know, um, thank you. Uh, thank you to Janet, her mother. Uh, Thank you for caring enough about this subject and about what we're doing. I, I really appreciate all the help that, that comes in. Uh, again, it's not about me. It's about those folks that can't do anything more than what they're doing right now. And they're just overwhelmed. They're completely overwhelmed. Um, and I think that, I think that I just talked about this on my podcast, but I feel like we are, we are happier people when we reach outside ourselves and we do something for someone else. I a lot totally of times agree. we get pretty, pretty zoomed in on our own life and our own, what we've got to get done. And uh, I think there's just a, there's something about it. Whenever we reach out and get, go after something, get something accomplished, touch someone else's life that it really makes our life a whole lot better than it was. And that's, I would I would encourage people to try that. Yeah, I I totally agree. Um, let's spread this video around. So if you're watching this video, and I know a lot of you are on Twitter because I interact with you on Twitter, or if you're not on Twitter, um, you're on Facebook, or if you're not on Facebook, you're on Instagram. Please share this video yeah. so that as many people can see it as possible and. Kindly instruct your friends to share the video as well. And kindly instruct them to tell the people that they're sharing the video with to share the video. Let's help these people out. Let's give them a hand, right? They, they've essentially been abandoned by uh, the people who are theoretically supposed to be there to take care of them. And at the end of the day, it really just comes down to us. It's really what it's all about. I, you know, 
politics aside, I don't think there's going to be a great savior for us with this system. And we have to be able to take up the slack. And that's part of the reason why we got to where we are today is that we did not take up enough slack on our own. And now we're having to make up for lost time. And we're we're having to grow up real fast here. So um, let's pitch in and let's, let's get this party started. Thank you for being here, Lee. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. And be sure and link the the full trailer in there on on YouTube so that they can see the full version, the full six and a half minutes. It's a it's it's moving, it's disturbing, uh, but it's real. Okay. Well, we'll do that. And you and I will communicate again somewhere down the line in the not too distant future. Okay. Love to. Thank you, sir. All right. Thanks for being here. That's Lee Wells. He is a podcaster, he's an author, he's a rancher, he's a documentarian, he's a Texan. And we'll be back on Sunday night with Sunday Night Astro Live. And until then, have a blessed day. I'm Robert Phoenix. This is the Friday Forecast. Chat Tari, you're the best. Take care and bye for now.